When all this happened, Bruce was still very young, but he still remembers it in every detail, as if it happened yesterday. It was summer. The heat was so intense that the asphalt was melting on the streets, and the city dwellers were seeking refuge from the heat in the fountains. Little Bruce was playing at home with his only toy car, as there were no other toys in the house. His mother and stepfather were sitting in the kitchen, drinking alcoholic beverages and singing. This was their favorite daily activity. Bruce had already gotten used to it. At that time, he thought that if it weren't for Uncle Leon, his mother would be a good person, she wouldn't shout, wouldn't throw things, and would be a kind, cheerful, affectionate woman who loved her son with all her heart. Now Bruce knew that, as usual, by midday his mother would come into his room and start complaining about how she was fed up and how she hated him. It's all your father's fault, she often said, wiping away the drunken tears streaming down her cheeks. He didn't make a child and went off with another woman. And I loved him so much. Look what he made me become. He ruined my whole life. Now you're in my way. Who needs a child? Tell me, please. And you still need to be fed, dressed, and shod. I hate it. Damn you along with your father. I'd send you to him, but that bastard went off to another country and left me here. So now I live and suffer with you. Bruce looked at his mother with frightened eyes, not understanding what he had done wrong to make her angry again. He tried to be quiet and didn't even ask for food, although he was very hungry. What are you staring at me for? You even look like your damn father. May he be cursed three times over, and you with him. After letting off steam, she would go back to the kitchen, pour herself a glass of vodka, drink it, then start crying bitterly, and finally fall asleep, collapsing fully clothed onto the old sagging sofa. And only when the house became quiet would Bruce leave his room and quietly creep into the kitchen. If there was anything left from the meal on the table, he would finish it, but more often than not, there was nothing but glasses and bottles. In that case, he would move a stool to the sink, turn on the tap, place his hand under it, and drink some water. Then he would return to his room and play quietly. Bruce behaved like a little mouse, quiet and almost invisible. He was afraid to wake up his mother and stepfather. Having learned from bitter experience, he knew that if he disturbed them, they would only become angrier. Bruce moved a small chair, climbed onto it, and looked out the window. Children were playing on the playground, and he heard their cheerful, ringing laughter. He wanted to play too, so he would take his toy car, carefully, to avoid making a loud noise, open the front door, and go to the playground. It was the same on that unfortunate day. Taking his toy car, Bruce went outside. When he approached the other children, they turned and went to play somewhere else as if on command. No one wanted to be friends with him, which he obviously couldn't understand at the time. Why did all the children turn away from him? Later, when Bruce grew up, he understood the children didn't like that he was always dirty, unkempt, smelled bad, and wore rags. But at that time, he didn't understand this, so he tried again to play with the other kids. He approached them again and followed them around like a shadow until an older boy said, Why are you following us? Can't you see we don't want to play with you? I have a toy car, Bruce said, smiling friendly, and offered his toy. The boy hit him on the hand, causing the car to fall. Play with your stinky car by yourself, and don't come near us again, got it? My mom says your mom is a drunkard and that when you grow up, you will be just like her. Bruce couldn't understand why he had to be like his mother. He wanted to ask the boy, but he didn't, seeing that the boy was angry. He silently picked up his car and, lowering his head, trudged to the sandbox. Actually, he was used to playing alone, and if the other children didn't want to be friends with him, then he wouldn't be friends with them either. 
he started building a garage out of sand so that his car could drive in and rest. He became so engrossed in building that he didn't notice the twilight or that all the children had already gone home. The heat had subsided, and it was even a bit cool. Bruce liked that no one was bothering him, so he continued playing. The boy didn't even notice when a large dog approached the sandbox. It sniffed around with interest, apparently searching for something to eat, and had not yet noticed Bruce. It had already grown dark outside, and Bruce decided it was time to go home. He stood up from the sandbox and was about to brush the sand off his knees and grab his toy car when the dog noticed him. It growled, and the fur on its neck bristled. Bruce wasn't scared. He smiled at the dog and said, Good dog, are you alone here too? But the stray dog wasn't interested in kind words and smiles. It bared its teeth and lunged at Bruce. The child's agonizing screams pierced the air, and neighbors rushed out of their apartments. They managed to rescue Bruce from the dog, called an ambulance, and he was immediately taken to the hospital. Aunt Cindy, who knew both the boy and his mother well, hurried to their home to warn them about Bruce's misfortune. She knocked on the door for a long time before someone opened it. Wendy, are you asleep or something? Your son was attacked by a dog. He's been taken to the hospital, and you're drunk again. What's it to you? Why are you shouting? What do you want from me? Wendy, still drunk, waved off the neighbor in confusion. Can't you hear me at all? Have you drunk away your brains? I'm telling you, a dog attacked your Bruce. He's in the hospital. Get yourself together and go to your son. Cindy shouted. Well, I'll go in the morning. It's already night now. Are you out of your mind? Wendy said, swaying and holding onto the doorframe to keep from falling. You're the one who's lost your mind. Here's the deal. If you don't go to your child, Child Protective Services will be at your house tomorrow morning. Have they already given you a warning? Well, I'll call them tomorrow, and they'll take your son away. You're wasting his benefits on booze while the child is left unattended. All right, there's no need to start yelling. I'll go now, just let me get ready. Oh, Wendy, I feel sorry for you. You used to be such a good woman, and you had a nice family, and your son was growing up so well. But no, you kept arguing with your husband. And what now? He left you and you're sinking lower and lower, already below the baseboard. At least have some pity on your son. The poor kid's done nothing wrong. I'll go to the hospital with you. He needs his mother now more than ever. Get ready quickly. At least wash your face and fix your hair. You look terrifying. Bruce, coming to, couldn't understand where he was for a long time. He was also surprised to find that he could only see with one eye. He couldn't remember what had happened to him. The boy wanted to get up but couldn't because his right side hurt very badly. He then touched his face with his left hand and realized it was wrapped in bandages. He felt very scared and immediately wanted his mother, and unable to hold back, he quietly started crying. Why are you crying, little one? asked a woman in a white coat. Does it hurt a lot? I want my mommy, Bruce sobbed. Where's my mommy? Your mommy will come, the woman said, frowning for some reason. Just hang in there a bit. I'd do something to those kinds of mothers myself. Bruce didn't understand what the woman wanted to do with her own hands, but he stopped crying. He felt warm and comfortable. However, he was very thirsty, and his body hurt more and more, but he knew he had to endure because he was a future man. As his father used to say, men must endure any pain and should never cry. Do you want anything? The woman in the white coat asked kindly again. Bruce nodded and asked for water. After the nurse gave him some to drink, he fell asleep again. When he woke up, 
he saw his mother sitting by his bed. Mom! Bruce exclaimed joyfully. You came. Of course I came. Where else would I go? His mother grumbled. And how did this happen to you? Why did you go near that dog? Now you need treatment. Do you know how much this costs? Medicines, ointments, antibiotics. Where am I supposed to get all that? It seemed that the nurse had overheard the last remarks made by Bruce's mother when she entered the room. Bruce saw her look distastefully at his mother before saying, Don't worry, we have everything we need here. So you don't need to spend any money on your son. Just try to visit him more often. But I was told I needed to stay here with him, Wendy replied. That's not necessary. Just visit him, and that's all. He's a smart boy, he understands everything. Besides, we've already become friends, haven't we, Bruce, the nurse said encouragingly. Bruce nodded and looked back at his mother. He really wanted his mom to hug him, pick him up, and rock him like she used to. Then all the pain would go away, and he would feel calm and easy. But his mother just sat on the chair, not even touching him. He saw how relieved she was when she learned she could leave. She jumped up from the chair, told Bruce she urgently needed to run some errands, and promised she would definitely come back the next day. Wendy was hanging laundry on the balcony when she saw Maggie hurrying home in the yard. Maggie was carrying a package. Wendy didn't hesitate to go down to meet her. Hi, Maggie. How's Bruce? How's he feeling? He's fine. He'll be better before the wedding. Why? Maggie asked, trying to pass by, but Wendy stopped her. While they shuffled from foot to foot, Wendy heard the clinking of bottles from Maggie's package. So, what's in that package of yours? Did you use the money we all collected for Bruce's medicine to buy vodka? Maggie widened her eyes dramatically and placed a hand on her chest. Are you kidding me? How could you think that? I spent all the money on medicine. This was given to me by Leon. He told me to buy some groceries for the house. I know your groceries. Better tell me if Bruce needs anything else. If needed, we'll help. Everyone was upset when this happened. God, where did that dog come from in our yard? Poor boy. Why does he have to go through this? I'm going to the hospital again tomorrow. The doctor told me there was nothing more I could do today. Bruce had a shot. He'll sleep until morning. I bought everything he needs, antibiotics, various ointments. The doctor said he would give me a list of anything missing tomorrow. Okay, Maggie, let us know if you need anything. We're all ready to help, Wendy sighed. Bruce felt like he had been in the hospital for a very long time. His mother, after visiting him for the first couple of weeks, completely stopped coming. The only visitor was Aunt Cindy, who also came to the hospital when they were preparing to discharge Bruce. Oh, my boy, Aunt Cindy lamented, looking at him. How are you going to live with a face like that now? Bruce understood what she meant. Half of his face was covered with terrible scars. The doctors had done all they could, but his right eye was nearly shut, and now his face looked like a mask from a horror movie. Aunt Cindy, is Mom at home? Why didn't she come for me? Your mom's at home, of course. I just couldn't wake her up, that's all. Well, fine, Bruce sighed. I baked some pies. We'll stop by my place first. I'll make you some tea. I also have a few things for you. While you were in the hospital, I noticed your pants had gotten too short. It's only right. You were eating properly there, three times a day. Your mother doesn't feed you like that, Wendy said kindly. Forgive me, son. We're used to not sticking our noses into other people's families. Well, 
people live their lives. And look what happened here. It's always like this with us, until, as they say, the roasted rooster pecks. Bruce didn't understand what Aunt Cindy meant by the roasted rooster, but he listened attentively and didn't interrupt. When they arrived home, Aunt Cindy indeed made him tea with pies, then gathered some of his things and took him home. His sleepy mother opened the door and, seeing her son, pretended to be happy to see him. Go to your room, dear. We'll talk later. I need to discuss something with Aunt Cindy, she said. I wanted to ask, can I apply for disability benefits for my son? Look at how awful he's become. Let the government foot the bill. Well, Wendy, you really are a despicable rat. Cindy couldn't hold back. I don't even want to talk to you anymore. And remember this, if you don't take care of your son, I'll definitely report you to Child Protective Services. Stop threatening me. If I wanted to, I'd have done it a long time ago. You're just foolish. Do you think your son would be better off in an orphanage? I feel sorry for Bruce, not for you at all. You've drunk away your brains. Get yourself together, I'm asking you nicely. Get a job. Remember, Bruce is growing up. Right now, he still loves you, but sooner or later, he'll understand. What kind of mother you are, and in your old age, don't expect him to bring you a glass of water. And he'll be right to do so. Bruce still doesn't like to think about his school years. At first, he had to endure ridicule and bullying from his classmates, who openly laughed at his appearance. By that time, he already knew he looked repulsive and tried to explain to the kids that it wasn't his fault. He was also surprised that almost all the teachers treated him with some sort of distaste. It was only in the later years of school that he managed to establish some sort of contact with them. Surprisingly, Bruce excelled academically. He found subjects easy, and he almost didn't have to study because his memory was phenomenal. Gradually, the guys got used to him and started to treat him more calmly. Besides, Bruce had a very kind heart. He was always the first to rush to help. By the 11th grade, Bruce fell in love. It was a girl named Ashley who lived in his building. She had recently moved with her parents from another city. When Ashley first saw him, she couldn't hide her fear. But then he mustered up the courage, approached her, and suggested they just hang out and be friends. Ashley was a year younger than him, in the 10th grade, and complained that she had poor grades in chemistry. Our teacher is some kind of inadequate, couldn't explain anything properly. Our whole class doesn't understand chemistry. How about you? she asked. I love chemistry. Besides, I can't do without it. I want to go to medical school, so if you don't mind, I'd be happy to help you, Bruce offered. From that day on, Bruce began to help Ashley improve in chemistry. As he interacted with her, he fell more and more in love with her. Ashley, on the other hand, treated him purely as a friend. Of course, Bruce understood that with his appearance, it was unlikely any girl would ever look at him, and he just had to come to terms with that. When Bruce was accepted into college, he shared the joyful news with only two people, Aunt Cindy and Ashley. Aunt Cindy was very pleased and even baked Bruce's favorite cake to celebrate. Drink your tea, Bruce. Drink up. I'll give you another piece. You're such a smart boy. Even though life has been cruel to you, you've done well, you've managed. And did you tell your mother that you got into college? No, Aunt Cindy, my mother doesn't care about me. She doesn't even talk to me, she's angry with me. Angry about what? That you're supporting her and her companions? She should be grateful to you. Not only do you study excellently, but you also find time to work. She doesn't like that I don't let her husbands, as she calls them, into the house. I got tired of her constant drinking and partying, Aunt Cindy. 
At first, I thought if no one was home, my mom would get her act together. So, I drove those drunkards out of the house. But I was wrong. She just started leaving and coming home drunk. Oh, son. A grave will correct a hunchback. Maybe we should try to get her into rehab? To get her into rehab, she would have to want it herself. I've tried to persuade her and even threatened, but she doesn't want any of it. She's okay with this life. I remember that when my dad was living with us, she wasn't like this. I don't understand what happened to her. She was probably like this before. You know, some people are inclined to this kind of behavior. It sits inside them and gnaws away. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, never mind. Tell me instead, how are things with Ashley? She's a nice girl. Do you like her? Yes, Aunt Cindy. But it's no use. She doesn't like me. And who would, really? I've gotten used to it. Don't despair, son. You're going to be a doctor. Once you finish your studies, get a job at a good clinic, and get plastic surgery, everything will be fine. No, Aunt Cindy. The doctor said that while some scars might be removed, my face can't be touched because something is wrong there. I'll find out more, but as for my eye, there's nothing that can be done. Can you see it all? Even a little, son? It seems like your eye is completely closed. I don't even know anymore if I see with it or not. I've gotten used to it. I see perfectly fine and don't know if it's with one eye or both. Years flew by unnoticed. Thesis defense, dissertation, graduate school. Bruce was consumed by his studies and work. He knew he had made the right choice by becoming a doctor. However, some colleagues occasionally reminded him that with his appearance, he had chosen the completely wrong profession. Understand, Bruce, when people come to us, they need to see a friendly doctor with a nice face and a smile. But you, sorry to say, are terrible, and you'll only scare the patients. Do you think that a smile and a pretty face can help in making a diagnosis? I don't think so. First and foremost, a doctor must be highly qualified, and I don't think it matters much to the people with their problems how I look. They just need a doctor who can help them. Listening to his attractive colleagues, Bruce decided to do everything in his power to open his own private clinic. It would be convenient for everyone, and he also felt that these colleagues were just envious. They were upset that he, a misfit, so different from them, had achieved much greater success than they had. For the past two years, Bruce had been working at the clinic he established. He set the goal of making his clinic one of the best, first in the city, then in the region, and eventually in the country. Through hard work, a lot could be achieved. Within a year, his clinic was renowned, with everyone eager to be treated by him. He had long lines of patience, was an excellent doctor, and a good person. He made many good friends who understood that a person's appearance wasn't the most important thing, what mattered was the soul. However, his personal life remained unchanged. He did have women in his life, but he knew it wasn't genuine. They were attracted to him only because of his success. And, of course, the money. He had a recently purchased apartment, a good car, and a substantial sum on his bank card. But he wished he were loved for who he was, not for these things. With Ashley, nothing worked out. They just remained friends. He saw that no matter how hard he tried, she would never love him, and he was genuinely happy for her when she married the guy she met when she started college. Bruce realized that he was likely to remain alone and decided to dedicate himself entirely to his work. He clearly remembers the day a severely ill young man was admitted to his clinic. The doctors had given him an incurable diagnosis, and the relatives, reaching out to Bruce, didn't hide that his clinic was their last hope. 
Dylan was constantly visited by a very beautiful girl who took care of him tenderly. At first, Bruce thought she was the patient's wife, but then they struck up a conversation, and Nancy revealed that she and Dylan were siblings, left alone early in life after their parents died, and that Dylan had replaced their father for her. There are other relatives, too. You've met them. They're wonderful, kind, and decent. But my brother is everything to me in this world. When we learned he was terminally ill, I thought I'd die myself. We tried everything, went everywhere, and then someone recommended your clinic. Thank you, Bruce. You are a wonderful doctor and a wonderful person. From that moment, they began to communicate frequently, and Bruce saw for the first time that a beautiful girl was genuinely interested in him. She didn't focus on his appearance. She looked much deeper, where everyone else avoided looking. He himself was afraid to believe it, as he had long since become accustomed to his appearance repelling people, especially women. With Dylan, everything was fine. He was recovering, and finally, the happy day came when Nancy's brother was discharged. Bruce lost hope. He thought that Nancy would likely forget about him now, as she probably interacted with him only because he was a doctor and treated her brother. But Nancy came to see him the next day. Hello, Bruce, please forgive me, but I could not come. I just want to tell you that you are the most wonderful person on earth. I understand you're probably told this all the time, but believe me, they all speak the truth. Bruce didn't know what to say. He wanted to reply that no one had ever said such things to him and that most likely no one even thought so, but he remained silent. He simply looked at Nancy and didn't know what to do next. Bruce, Nancy continued, I understand you might think this is silly and unattractive, but I have to say, invite me somewhere. After Bruce and Nancy got married, he often asked her what it was about him that she found so appealing. And she always replied that as soon as she got to know him, she thought that this man was incredibly beautiful.